But his research covers both freshwater and marine phases of some monitored fisheries, including uh, invasive species and salmon rivers and pink salmon in particular. And he's also involved in several national and international research projects and assessment groups and advisory organisations. So we're looking forward to his contribution today. And the title of his talk is Pink Salmon in the Northernmost Atlantic Area. So uh, over to you, Jackal. And welcome. Thank you, Colin. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I haven't got it. Yep. And uh, uh, can you see? You can see my presentation. Yeah, it's, but it's not in presentation mode. I will. I will turn that into the present day. Now, okay. Yep. Great. When you go, it's magic. Okay. Great. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and greetings from uh, from the snowy, chilly northern Finland. It's something like minus 15 centigrade, so it's not that cold, but it's it's kind of a typical February day. Um, I'm going to talk about pink salmon in the North Atlantic and in particular in the northernmost areas of the of the North Atlantic around the Barents Sea area. And um, just for a very, very brief introduction, a few facts about uh, pink salmon. That is quite a special species among the Pacific salmon species. It's the smallest, uh, least fecund, uh, showing the highest growth rates uh, at sea. It's the most abundant. And uh, probably most importantly, especially when we talk about its nature as an invasive species in the Atlantic area, is the very strict two year li uh, life cycle of, of, of the species which means that uh, that uh, they are the uh, odier and even new populations. I guess most of you know already, but uh, but pink salmon was uh, first introduced uh, from the Pacific area, from the Pacific Russian Far East uh, to the Russian Kola Peninsula White Sea area in late 50s. Uh, they first came from the Zahalin Islands a little bit further south, the, the red dot on the map. But they changed their donor stock in, in mid 80s to a more northerly source uh, to the Ola River stock in the Magadan area. And uh, that was better adapting to the Kola White Sea areas. I guess the climate conditions were more similar between those two areas. And that's when the actual real uh, natural reproduction started in the Atlantic area. The audio stock has been very successfully introduced. As we know, the even year population is weak. There are some also in the Atlantic area, but it's uh, much less abundant compared to the audio stock. Russians have uh, reported that uh, they stopped all stocking in 2001. So thereafter, all the returns of pink salmon should be from, from natural production only. Uh, natural reproduction started in the Kola Peninsula area uh, from mid 80s onwards, gradually moved into northeast of Norway in some of the Finnmark rivers. Fairly small spawning population, some self-sustaining maybe, but all of a sudden, 2017, a big expansion in abundance and distribution area in the Atlantic area, and uh, uh, first time recorded in, in some areas in, in the Northeast Atlantic. 2019 was fairly similar to 2017. I know that there are some areas further south where 2019 was not a real pink salmon year, like we heard from Alan's talk. But in the big picture, I guess, and especially in the north, those two years were fairly similar. There were some changes, some differences between between regions, but but uh, it was still a big pink salmon year. And in 2021, uh, overall, there was much more pink salmon compared to 2019 and 2017. And in the northernmost areas, uh, there's been estimated like 10-fold increase between those 
between 2019 to 2021. Uh, the map on the right hand side uh, is from the Norwegian Nina Institute website. I have updated a little bit some of that. There are new records from 2021 from different parts of North East Canada, uh, East Coast of, Iceland, uh, of Greenland. And yes, there is also a record in the Baltic Sea now. Last summer, there were some pink salmon caught in the Gulf of Finland on the on the Estonian coast, like is shown on the map. Uh, these are the few odd years uh, from the nor uh, from the from the Nor uh, information from the Norwegian catches. As you can see, for instance, the link between 2015 to 2017 does not make sense in a way that those 2017 fish returning to those rivers are not really returning. They, they can't be from those spawning populations that were in those rivers in 2015. So this is of course a question of homing and, and, and spreading from source. Uh, there's a small video or, or animation prepared by the Nina Institute in Norway that I'm going to show you. It shows the long-term development of the Norwegian pink salmon catches. As you can see, 70s, 90s, 80s, not very much. All of a sudden, 15, 17, 19, 21. Huge increase in pink salmon abundance and distribution over those few years. It's running again. Pay attention uh, to the difference between the odd years and even years, also in the latest years, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So the odd year population is really the dominant one. A little bit closer look to the to the Barents Sea White Sea area. And this is information from 2021 last year. Starting from the left, uh, Norway in total, I think the current estimate is something like 150,000 pink salmon captured in rivers and, and, and in coastal fisheries. The Finnmark, the northernmost part of Norway alone, something like 70,000 plus pink salmon were removed from rivers in the big, big mass removal fisheries. Going into further details, the Varangefjord rivers, which is this area in the northeast where the red arrow is pointing, there is something like half a dozen rivers in, in that area. And in those rivers alone, between 10 and 20,000 pink salmon were removed per river. Some of those are very small. Some of those are almost like ditches you, you basically jump over. And in some of those rivers, they removed something like 20, 15, 10,000 pink salmon. So it's it's unbelievable. Then further into individual rivers, uh, the Teno Tana River, the big river system, uh, which is the border between northern Finland and northern Norway. I'm going to go into some of the details later. We counted 50. 1,000 pink salmon entering that river by a sonar, which is located in the lower part of the main stem. Then moving over to Russia, in the Murmansk region, which is pretty much equal to the Kola Peninsula area right here, the whole area, the nominal catch, which was declared, was something like uh, 200 metric tons or a bit more. And then finally, a single river, the Varzuga River, which is on the on the south shore, the north shore of the White Sea. Uh, 300 tons of pink salmon were captured in, in that river. A bit closer look to Russia. This is the past 20 years of catch development in the Murmansk region. As you can see, it's in most years, it's been a, around 100 metric tons of pink salmon. And then there was a steady increase in 13, 15, 17, 19, and then 21. That is a, a tentative figure, but it is close to two, uh, 600 um, tons of, of, uh, of pink salmon. It could be more. 
The river Varzuga I was referring to, they have this big massive uh, so-called ruse trap, which is a commercial salmon trap. They have been operating for decades in that river. And nowadays it's commercial uh, salmon fishing, not the cooperative anymore. So they have a commercial quota and that, that's fairly strict for Atlantic salmon catches, which means that they were only able to catch two weeks in July. And during those two July weeks last year, they caught 300 tons of pink salmon, which means something like 200,000 individuals. And they were not able to operate the trap all the time, not every day, not 24 hours a day. So the estimate of the total run of pink salmon to that river is somewhere between half a million and one million pink salmon. I have seen some videos from some tributaries which are like like swarming. It's it's like boiling of pink salmon entering some of the tributaries. That river is a fairly large river, but it's not huge. It's much smaller than, for instance, the river Teno that I'm going to talk about next. The Teno River is uh, one of the northernmost salmon rivers, Atlantic salmon rivers in the world. Uh, definitely the northernmost large Atlantic salmon river in the world. You can see the 70 northern latitude just uh, across the mid midsection of the river right here. Uh, it's a remote area, fairly few people living in that area, forming the border between northern Norway and Finland. There are three languages in the area, so we have three different names for the river because of those languages. Um, more than 16,000 square kilometer catchment and the main stem uh, headwater branches and tributaries included something like 1200 kilometers accessible to Nadromos Atlantic salmon. We have, been, we have been able to identify 30, something like close to 30 genetically distinct Atlantic salmon populations in, in that system in different tributaries and, and parts of the, of the watershed. So it's an interesting system. That, that red dot in the middle, that is actually where our, our research station is. And this is the, the bank of the river. Uh, this side is Finland, that side is Norway, and that's, that's where the research station is. That's where we operate all the monitoring and research programs in the area. Monitoring of the salmon populations has been going on for a very long time uh, at the Teno River. Uh, we started uh, collecting systematic catch statistics and catch samples since uh, early 70s. We have permanent elk fishing sites in different parts of the system since uh, late 70s. We have video monitoring of ascending salmon in a in, in couple of tributaries since early 2000s. Snorkeling counts of sp spawning salmon in three or four different tributaries, uh, also almost 20 years now. And then we have sonars operational in different parts of the system. We don't have long time series of those, but, but, but still uh, some years of operation. Uh, just an example of some of these uh, monitoring sites that we have that are counting either ascending or spawning salmon. You can see the different colors. Red is sonars. So this is 2021. We used four different sonar uh, monitoring sites uh, last year, uh, two different video monitoring sites, and then we had three tr small tributaries that we snorkeled and counted the spawners. So just to give you a, a kind of a feel of the, the uh, extent of the monitoring programs within this one river system. OK, a little bit of the history and development of pink salmon in the system. Yeah, first observations came from very early years, quite very soon after the Russians introduced them to the Kola Peninsula. Uh, there were some catches, I guess there were some difficulties in actually recognizing pink salmon in the early years, especially the anglers were perhaps not that aware of the new species. And if you look at some of these pictures, it's not always that obvious when you talk about the fresh, uh, uh, fresh pink salmon in the river and compare that with, with grills and sea trout. Some years actually produced fairly nice catches in the early years, in the 70s. 
uh, but those were dependent de dependent on on the big uh, introductions of eggs and fry in Kola Peninsula. But then when the natural reproduction started, there were a bit higher catches in 90s and then in 2000s. Uh, here is the catch development on the upper left corner and you can see the relatively low catch here with some hundreds of kilograms in most years ah, and then all of a sudden <clears throat> okay. all of a sudden on the 2017 huge peak in, in abundance and on the bottom right you can see uh, those estimated numbers of pink salmon actually entering the river um, there are sonar counts in the mainstream in these two uh, bars here, and this is 2017, which was uh, approximately at the same level. Something like 5,000 fish were estimated running to the river in, 20, in 17 and 2019, and 2021 it was 50,000, so it was a tenfold increase in the numbers. Looking at the different tributaries based on our monitoring system, we can see that the pink salmon have entered many of the tributaries, including some of the headwater branches. These dots are the monitoring sites, and for instance, here in the headwaters, there are records that pink salmon have actually entered this area, which is something like 250, 300 kilometers from the estuary, so quite far up in the system. But you can also see that some of the smaller tributaries, which are monitored quite intensively, we still don't see pink salmon. So they are not entering every single tributary. They are differences and they seem to be preferring a bit larger ones, at least for now. We have carried out some other studies on pink salmon quite recently. There is eDNA, obviously, that we have done in collaboration with our Norwegian colleagues. Uh, uh, now we have now run it 2019-2021 uh, in different tributaries and had some confirmation from other sources of information from our counts, and and we are we are underway in reporting that. We did some radio telemetry tracking last year too, tagged with uh, some some individuals with radio transmitters and followed their migration. Uh, postponing movements and so forth, and that analysis of, the, of those data is, is underway. We looked into the spawning areas first time ever in this Ten River because we have never ever seen such big uh, uh, groups of spawning pink salmon. So that was interesting to see the characteristics of the area where they really uh, congregated. It was typical that they were in a very shallow area, 20, 30, 40 centimeters in depth, very close to the shore, 20, 30 meters from the shoreline. Although, as you can see in the uppermost picture, that area is something like 200 meters wide, the river, and still they were very, very close to the, close to the shoreline, although they were uh, shallow areas in the mid-channel as well, but, but we never saw pink salmon in those areas. They typically need fairly swift current and, and some kind of a gravel pebble substrate, fairly, uh, fairly fine substrate compared to large salmon. We also uh, looked into the egg and alevin development, uh, monitored three different spawning areas in the, in the Teno main stem, and uh, first of all, the pink salmon spawn very early in that area. They start probably in the last days of July, at least in early August, and that goes on to mid-September or something, and then most of them are gone. Uh, the egg development is, is very, very early. Most eggs were eyed already in late August, and, uh, and uh, most eggs actually hatched by late September or early October, and that's the time when Atlantic salmon starts spawning in the area. So these guys are much, much, much earlier than Atlantic salmon. And we will continue this and try to find the smolts in the following spring. Whenever we can get to the areas, they have there's something like one meter of ice on top of that at the moment. OK, these were, the, were our uh, maybe the last sampling date in October. It was pretty cold and pretty Pretty challenging conditions. As you can see, the alevins have already been growing 
if you look at this picture from uh, from the from September, the bottom right picture, and then this one in late October, the yolk sac is smaller. There's more uh, pigment coloration in the in the alumin, so so there is development. And my question is that what is going to happen to these guys? Are they going to emerge before the actual ice formation, or are they going to spend a very long winter in the gravel uh, until April or, or May or something? So I don't know. We are going to continue whenever we can. We have access to to that area or those areas. The, different areas. Few words about the interactions between Atlantic salmon and pink salmon from what we have understood and, and learned from our experience. I'm talking about Atlantic salmon now, but of course the same goes for sea trout or maybe some other species, but uh, I'm focusing on Atlantic salmon here. There are some differences uh, between the species which are probably uh, uh, which are probably helping Atlantic salmon, so to speak. Pink salmon is spawning earlier, as I said, and as everybody, I guess, knows. And thanks God, it's not the other way around. Uh, juvenile pink salmon migrate to the sea very soon after emergence in the, in the spring, so they don't hang around in the river and compete with Atlantic salmon, at least not for a long time. They are, there's this little question mark and, and but here. There is this long history of pink salmon, Atlantic salmon being in the same rivers in the Russian Kola Peninsula, and it seems like there is no direct evidence of Atlantic salmon population collapsing because of the increase of pink salmon population. Perhaps a question mark again. There are less known factors. That's the parasites, pathogens, the potential juvenile competition early in the spring, competition for space in the pre-spawning areas, there are the nutrient-launched river systems, the bacteria concentrations coming from the big masses of carcasses. And one thing to be remembered is the scale. I'm talking about the Tenor River, which is a very big river. But what about the small river? say 500 or 1000 Atlantic salmon spawning population and maybe 10,000 pink salmon entering those rivers. And that's 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 the very reality in, in, in parts of Norwegian coast or the Kola Peninsula or maybe in the future further south. Uh, Alan said that uh, female pink salmon are cryptic and, and that's true in coloration and the, and the males are vicious. They have these teeth and they look very fierce, but our experience from following the spawning behavior is that actually the females are the vicious ones. Those are the active ones and I have a little video here. Hope it works. Look at the females. The male is here and the female bang. She obviously didn't like our GoPro camera at all. And finally, actually, she lost her teeth by banging the teeth towards the camera like this. And look at the males. They are just uh, shy and in the background. So these guys are very, very aggressive. And just think about the small river holding pool with some Atlantic salmon and uh, individuals like this entering the area in big numbers. OK, then something about the removal activities. Uh, in Norway, they have removed lots of pink salmon in some rivers in 17, 19, 21. We are going to hear about this from Turat Lemu, who is the next speaker, so I don't use too much time on this. But as you can see, there has been massive removals of pink salmon in some of the northern Norwegian rivers. And there is lots of interest and lots of demands being in, in the Teno River Valley yeah, as well, both in Finland and Norway, but there's been no real action so far. It's still open. What 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 should we do about this? And the, and the Teno is very large compared to to the rivers where these mass removals have been taking place. So how is this going to work in, in practice? What are the options? The question is the goal. How do you define the quantitative goal for such removals? How much effort do you put in? 
And the big question is the Atlantic salmon. How do you avoid causing extra mortality to Atlantic salmon when really doing like putting in a big effort for, uh, to remove the, the, the pink salmon? There are plans going on developing fishing gear for, for removals on the Finnish side and, and, and discussions about the goals underway. So let's see what is going to happen next year. Just a couple of words about the kind of big picture. They are the two big superpowers of pink salmon in the north. One is Norway with the 400 plus salmon rivers and many of them invaded now by pink salmon and of course Russia, which is the source, which is the original place uh, of introduction of pink salmon in the Atlantic area. Those are the two main players in the north, at least for now. Norway has stated a very strong determination to fight the alien species and, and, and do whatever it takes to, to control this invasive species. And there is this Norwegian action plan, and we are going to hear more about that very soon. At the same time, Russia, there is no such determination. They, 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 are, they have no plans to actually restrict the pink salmon distribution or abundance or numbers or anything. They are much more interested in, in, in harvesting the species in different ways. So what, how is this going to affect the rest of the Northeast Atlantic when these two big sources of pink salmon at the moment are, they have so different strategies. Then there are, there are the massive removals that Norway has done already in 2017, 19 and 21. So there is lots of experience of that already. How is that working? Is it working? What should we do? What could be done in different types of rivers and so forth? And the other very important point is the pink salmon and Atlantic salmon interactions. And Russia should have a very long experience or already decades in how these two species are actually doing it together. What do the time series data actually show? Unfortunately, there is no real good published information about these topics, not about the, the effects of these removals, not about the actual uh, uh, coexistence of Atlantic salmon and pink salmon. And I think this is a problem. Just uh, looking into some concluding words, we have seen this rapid increase in the North Atlantic. In the North, it's been a tenfold increase between 2019 and 21. And then the question is that, what are we going to see next year? Is it going to be another tenfold increase? Is it going to be a boom and a bust? Is it going to crash and of course the years to come? What about the management? What, what kind of measures should we introduce? How big massive removals are going to be put in place? What are the effects of such removals? What are the impacts on Atlantic salmon and other species in the, in the other, other original species in the river? And I'm emphasizing that we need much better exchange of experience, information, data between areas between countries and we need a large scale joint research programs. I'm not alone here. There's a list of my dear colleagues from Finland, Norway and Russia who have helped me pulling this data together. So thank you and thank you for your interest.